Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. Hey, uh, before we jump into the message this morning, I want to remind you or let you know about something, actually. So uh, you, hopefully you know we're going to be having Christmas Eve services at 4.30 and 6 p.m. And we decided to do our Christmas Eve services on December 24th this year, just so you guys know. All right. Um, but <clears throat> we want to do something a little bit special that evening. Uh, hopefully the whole evening is special, but we're going to have a little special extra thing happening. Uh, so we've talked to a couple pizza delivery places, and um, I t- we talked to their managers, their owners, and we asked, hey, do you have a delivery person that could use a little bit of extra help this year? And so they're going to be delivering a pizza during the service, and we would like to bless them with a, a nice tip this year. So how we're going to do that is, I'm just letting you know this, we're not putting it out there any other place. Uh, if you want to participate in this, this is an above and beyond your regular giving type of thing, please bring cash that evening. We're just going to give a cash tip, and we're going to collect it right at the beginning of each service. And we're going to have two different delivery people, so they don't know about this. But we want to just, uh, we want to make this an incredible, special Christmas to to one of these people who has to work on Christmas Eve. So again, if you want to participate in that, please bring some cash with you this, uh, to our Christmas Eve services, and we're going to bless someone this year. Um, So, welcome uh, to Ugly Christmas Sweater Sunday. (laughs) Uh, First service when I got up here to preach, there were a few people that were wearing my picture uh, (laughs) on their sweater. (laughs) And so they're not here, as you can tell. We did some church discipline and excommunicated. No. Uh, (laughs) A few years ago, my my old church, uh, the worship department, decided to do an ugly Christmas sweater party. And then they decided, well, we're just going to do a party. We're not going to do the ugly Christmas sweater side of things. And so one of my friends showed up to the party, and he saw another woman there. And he said, Sandy, didn't you hear? We're, We're not doing the ugly Christmas sweater party. And she goes... I'm sorry, what? (laughs) So uh, I've enjoyed seeing some of your fun and goofy sweaters and laughing at them. But if I laughed at yours and you didn't know it was Ugly Christmas Sweater Sunday, I just want to publicly apologize uh, if I hurt your feelings. (laughs) Well, we are in the third week of a series called The Stories of Christmas. uh, and, And stories are important, aren't they? Stories help us to remember things, and especially at Christmas time, they, they kind of add more value to that time. They help us remember important events, m- capture memorable moments. And so for this series, what we've been doing is we've been looking at the stories of Christmas that we read about in the New Testament. And so far, we've looked at Matthew's story of Christmas and Luke's story of Christmas. And today we want to look at John's story of Christmas. And each story gives us a little different perspective on the Christmas story, on Christ's entrance into the world. But John's story that we're looking at today is very different from that of Matthew and Luke. So if you grew up in church, you you probably know that the New Testament, uh, in the New Testament, there are four books of the Bible that we call the Gospels. Gospel simply means good news. And so these are stories, these are books that share the good news of Jesus Christ. They provide us with an account of Jesus' life. Now, uh, Mark, Mark's gospel is what we call the action gospel. We believe that he got his information from Peter. And if you know the apostle Peter, he's kind of that action guy, right? And so his gospel is a little bit more fast paced and it moves from scene to scene, action to action rather rapidly. But Mark's gospel does not give us an account of the birth of Christ. Instead, he just jumps right into the uh, action of Jesus public ministry. But other than Mark skipping over the, uh, the birth of Christ, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in their telling of the life of Jesus. In fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call the synoptic gospels. Synoptic simply means seen together or as parallel. And so what it means is they're very similar. So these these Gospels, they're called that because of their similarities. Now, Matthew and Luke are the Gospels that we go to this time of year because they give us the the traditional account of the birth of Christ. They talk about Joseph and Mary, the census, the angels, the shepherds, the star, the, the wise men, the manger, kind of what we just heard with the kids, right? But then there's John's Gospel. And John's gospel is a, is a very different gospel. And it's different when it talks about Jesus' arrival as well. One of the reasons that John's gospel is so different is because of the amount of time that, that John spent with Jesus. If you remember, John was one of Jesus' apostles, one of Jesus' closest friends, maybe even his closest. He's often referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved or the beloved disciple. 
Another reason John's gospel is so different is because of what John experienced after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. So his experience gives us a little bit of a different perspective. And then another reason his gospel is so different is just the sheer age of John when he wrote his gospel. And all of these factors are very important things to consider when we look at, at what John writes about Jesus, especially at this time of year. John, John is able to look back at his life and look back at the impact that Jesus had not only on his life, but on the whole world as he writes down his gospel. See, John's gospel was written somewhere between 85 and 95 AD. So if John was about 20 years old when Jesus was crucified, which is what most people believe, that, that would make him about 75 to 85 years old when he wrote his gospel. John also wrote uh, the book of Revelation in 95 AD, right before he, he died. But at 75 or 85 years old, it's almost as if when John went to write his gospel, he thought, you know what? I better get all of this down now because I don't know how much time I have left. And I want to make sure that these stories are passed on and passed on accurately for future generations. Now, there's no doubt that, that John had told these stories that he put in his gospel over and over to many groups of people. I mean, imagine being someone who sat at the feet of Jesus for his entire ministry, being someone who walked and talked with Jesus, being one of only three people who got to see Jesus transfigured. Imagine being so close to Jesus that you were there when he was crucified. John was able to be up close and personal to see a resurrected Jesus. And so people knew this about John and they wanted to be around him and they wanted to hear from him these firsthand encounters that he had with the savior of the world, right? So no doubt, people had to be coming up to him all the time and saying, John, tell us what it was like. Tell us what it was like when, when Jesus did this and Jesus did that. And so John's age and what he had been through in his lifetime, they really helped to bring to life the words that he writes in his gospel, and especially in the very first chapter of John. But let me tell you some things that John would have seen and experienced after Jesus' death resurrection, and ascension. And these are things that you won't find in the pages of your Bible. I mean, we all know that he was right there with Jesus throughout his three-year earthly ministry, but it's his perspective and his commentary years later about the historical accounts of Jesus' life that make his gospel and really our understanding of Jesus all the more amazing. So again, John is a very old man by the time he, he writes this gospel. And by this time, John had experienced a lot of loss in his lifetime. Some of you, you may be struggling this Christmas because you've experienced a lot of loss this past year. And this is the first Christmas maybe that you're, you're spending without a loved one. Like just in the, the six months that I've been here at this church, uh, I've been to, I believe, eight funerals, eight funerals. These families are without a loved one for, the, for this Christmas for the first time. And maybe some of you, you're feeling that pain at this time of year. Maybe it's a mom or a dad, a sister or a brother, a grandma or a grandpa, maybe even a husband or wife. Maybe it's a friend or a colleague that you spend a lot of time with over the holidays. And so maybe, maybe some of you are, are really grieving this year. Maybe for some of you, it's not a death. Maybe, maybe this is the first Christmas since the divorce, and now you're trying to figure out how you're going to split time with kids. Loss is hard, and especially at this time of year. We, we have all these traditions, we make all these memories, we have all this family time, and loss is difficult. But the Apostle John, by, the, by this point in his life when he writes this gospel, he had experienced loss in his lifetime like you and I can't even begin to imagine, no matter what your story is like. He had lost lots of friends, lots of family, and in some ways he'd lost his whole society, his whole, his whole culture. You see, John was alive when Emperor Nero ruled the Roman Empire. Emperor Nero sent General Vespasian into Galilee, and Vespasian and his army began to work their way down through Galilee, destroying all of these Jewish cities and all these Jewish towns, and slaughtering thousands upon thousands of Jewish people, and then sending thousands of Jewish men, women, and children into the slave markets of Rome. John lived through that. 
John lived through the time when Vespasian trapped thousands of Jewish rebels in the city of Jerusalem, the same city where John had, had experienced some of the most amazing events of his life. He had spent years there. And so John was either in the city of Jerusalem or perhaps, or I mean, he either saw that the city of Jerusalem was surrounded or perhaps, possibly, John might have even been in the city of Jerusalem. We just don't know. But for seven months, the city of Jerusalem was surrounded and people were starving to death. Plagues broke out. It was just this horrible, horrible scene. And once the Roman infantry breached the city, they were merciless. Thousands of Jews were butchered. First century Jewish historian Josephus, he wrote this. He said, the slaughter within was even more dreadful than the spectacle from without. Men and women, old and young, insurgents and priests, those who fought and those who entreated mercy were hewn down in indiscriminate carnage. The legionnaires had to clamor over heaps of dead bodies to carry on the work of extermination. Those who were spared were not spared out of mercy, but out of greed. Survivors, including children, were sold to slavers who waited impatiently for their payday. And at the end of this Jewish war in 70 AD, John was there, or he would have heard the story of how his beloved temple that he had been to as a kid was burned to the ground. The priests were slaughtered, and everything of value that survived the flames was carted off and hauled away. In the end, over one million Jews were slaughtered, and Josephus put the number of Jews sold as slaves in the hundreds of thousands. Historians say that up to half of the Roman Empire was composed of slaves in the first century. Half of the population was slaves. And John lived through this. By the time that John wrote his gospel, persecution against Christians had broken out. During Nero's reign, there was this huge fire in like a slum area of Rome. And so this fire broke out and it's believed, we believe that uh, Nero actually set this fire because he believed it was just this eyesore to his city, his great city. And so he set this fire, but what he did is he blamed this fire on Christians and he used this as a springboard to begin persecuting Christians. And so the, the Christians were, were severely persecuted because of this. You can read this in history books of how, how Christians were covered in, in wild animal hides and they were fed to dogs. Some of them were nailed to crosses. Uh, he would have some of them just beaten to death. One of his favorite things to do, though, was to throw these elaborate parties at his palace and in the evening when it got dark, he would take Christians and have them impaled and on stakes and lit on fire to light up his gardens. He was just this evil, evil man. And so John would have suffered tremendous loss at the hands of Nero and his men. John's friend Peter, the Apostle Peter, and his friend Paul, the Apostle Paul, would have been executed during the reign of Emperor Nero. Additionally, all the other apostles, except for John, they were put to death because of their faith, including John's brother, James. In Acts 12, verse 2, we read that King Herod had, had, had put uh, John's brother, James, and, and taken him, captured him, and put him to death by the sword. It's believed that that was by beheading. So imagine, imagine looking back on your life, and all of your closest friends and even family, all of them put to death, executed in your lifetime. And through all of that loss, through all of that destruction and chaos and pain that we cannot even begin to imagine, John never lost his faith in Jesus. In fact, at the end of John's gospel, and again, nearing the end of John's life, he would write this in John 20, verse 30. He said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his, his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. In other words, John is saying, he's filled his gospel, he's written this gospel, and he's written all these amazing stories about what Jesus did and said, but he's like, I just didn't have enough time, enough room to put everything in there. In fact, there's just not enough room to, to write down all the amazing things that he, he ever did. But here's what John said about the writings that he did put in his gospel, what he did actually write down. He said, but these are written that you may believe 
In other words, the reason I'm writing down this gospel, the reason I'm leaving this with you toward the end of my life is that I'm hoping that you will read this. You will read the account of Jesus' life and you won't simply be impressed by him or amazed at him or think he's some great rabbi or some great teacher. No, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life. And not just physical life, because you already have that physical life, right? But that you may have a different kind of life. Life in his name. And so John, in spite of what he had seen, in spite of what he had heard, in spite of what he had smelled, in spite of all the horrible things that he had witnessed and experienced in his lifetime, at the end of his life, with the destruction of everything that most people would see as being important to him, and the loss of pretty much everyone in his life that was important to him, John still believed that Jesus was the source of life. And it was a life that went beyond this physical life. And so when John sits down to write his gospel, he doesn't begin with the birth narrative. Now again, this is fascinating because many of you might remember that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, dying, he looked at John and he looked at his mother, Mary, and he asked John to take care of his mother. And he asked Mary to treat John as if this was his son, her son. And so John and Mary, they had a very special relationship. They would have spent a significant amount of time together. Many believe that John uh, eventually took Mary to the city of Ephesus, where he ministered at a church there. And John took care of Mary there until she died. And you just know that they had spent a whole lot of time together sitting around, and John had to ask Mary questions. And the people in Ephesus had to ask Mary questions in the presence of John. And they'd all be like, Mary, did you know that your baby boy would give sight to the blind man? <laughs> and Mary, did you know that your baby boy would walk where angels trod? And she's like, yes, yes, I get it. I've heard the song before. I understand, right? But seriously, John would have heard firsthand from Mary about what she saw and experienced. He would have been able to sit down with her and ask her all the Mary, did you know questions that he ever wanted. And so he would have heard about the angel in the manger, the escape to Egypt. He would have heard over and over and over this birth narrative. And yet, when John begins his gospel, he doesn't begin with the shepherds or the angels, or a manger, or even Egypt, or Herod, or the Magi. He doesn't begin with the details of Jesus' birth, even though he probably knew all of the details, even though Mary had probably shared that story many, many times in front of him. Instead, John begins with the significance of the incarnation of Jesus. And just as things were very, very dark when John wrote his gospel, he was also reminded that when Jesus came into the world, it was also a very, very dark time as well. And so when John sat down to pen this gospel, before he got into the narratives, before he got into the teachings of Jesus and the details, here's what he said. And this is, this is so powerful because maybe, maybe you're living in a season of life that is just utterly complicated. And maybe you're at a point in life where it just seems very dark. You look at the world around you and you think, can it even get any worse? And so you're trying in this season of joy to have joy, to have celebration, but you're also reminded maybe of who won't be at Christmas this year. And so after a lifetime of seeing what John saw and experiencing what John experienced, he begins his gospel in this way, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So John calls Jesus the Word. And we've talked about the theological implications of this in our In the Beginning series. But just a quick reminder, John parallels the first words of his gospel with the first words of Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how was it that God created the heavens and the earth? He spoke them into existence. And then John calls Jesus the Word. Jesus was, was with God in the beginning, and he was God. So Jesus was the agent, the Word, by which all creation came into existence. 
John goes on, he says, he was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And so we read these amazing words of the deity of Jesus, the eternal nature of Jesus, the power of Jesus. But then listen to this. John writes, in him, in Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So John had all this time to think about this, all this time to soak in what he had seen and experienced with, with being with Jesus, all this time to soak in all the pain and the agony and destruction he had witnessed since then, Yet when he goes to write about Jesus, he says, you know, when I think about Jesus, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And it's not just physical life, although John shows that we're only here because of Jesus, right? Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. We have physical life because of Jesus. But Jesus brings true life, abundant life, and life eternal. And he says, it's not just for you. It's not just for me. It's not just available to the Jewish nation. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And then John makes this amazing statement about Jesus, and it's especially amazing in light of John's perspective and experience. He writes this. He says, the light shines in the darkness. And maybe as John wrote this, Maybe he thought about all of the darkness that was around him. Maybe he thought about all of the death, all the slavery, all the pain, all the suffering, all the persecution, all the corruption, all the darkness of this world. Maybe he thought about the darkest darkness of the day that Jesus was crucified as he witnessed the pain that Jesus went through. Or maybe he thought about the darkness of the day that the temple was destroyed. Or the darkness of how his friends were dragged away and they were put to death because they stood for their faith. Or maybe he thought about the darkness of how his brother stood before King Herod and held his ground and was beheaded by a mad dictator. But in spite of all that darkness, John says, this light shines in the darkness. And he says, and the darkness has not overcome it. You would think with all the darkness that he saw that that darkness would just loom over him. He says, the darkness has not overcome it. This light of Jesus shines in the darkness, rather. It's as if this darkness, as, as hard as it has tried to put out the light of Jesus, to snuff it out, to seize it, to surround it, to, to imprison it. As hard as this world, this culture that we live in, has tried to blow out this light, John says the darkness has not overcome it. This was a man who had seen darkness. He had seen the darkness of the world in every way possible. Yet as he reflected on Jesus, he says, in spite of the darkness that seems at times to be so overwhelming, this darkness has nothing on the light of the world. In spite of everything that this world has tried to do to eradicate this light that is life, the darkness has not overwhelmed it. It has not put it out. Caesar couldn't do it. Tiberius couldn't do it. Herod couldn't do it. Nero couldn't do it. Vespasian couldn't do it. The destruction of the temple didn't do it. The death of Jesus hadn't done it. And nothing that is going on in the world right now can do it either. This was a John who was absolutely convinced at the end of his life that no matter what happens in this life, and no matter what we face in this life, no matter how deep the heartache, no matter how extreme the fear, no matter how deep the depression, that there is a light that shines in the darkness and there is no amount of darkness that can put it out. So at Christmas, when we are confronted with the fact that there are, there are problems in this world that we just cannot solve, and there are people that we cannot control as much as we may try, 
And there are expectations that we will never, ever, ever meet. We are reminded that in the midst of all the darkness that we feel around us, that Jesus is life and light who overcomes the dark. In the Gospel of John, there are seven I am statements that are recorded that Jesus made about himself. We're actually going to take a look at each of those in a series this spring. But in John 8, 12, we have one of those I am statements where Jesus said this. He said, I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Do you want the light of life? And it says that we are to follow Jesus. When we follow him, we will never walk in darkness because he is life and light who overcomes the dark. And so at this time of year, we celebrate what happened about 2,000 years ago or so, that the word that John was talking about, that this word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we, along with John, have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. So God took on flesh, and as the Message Bible says, he moved into the neighborhood. He made his dwelling among us. And John was one of those special people who was able to walk and talk with Jesus. He was able to get to know Jesus like no one on earth ever knew him. And after everything he had seen and everything he had experienced with Jesus, and after everything he had seen and everything he had experienced without Jesus in the flesh, he says, in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Not then, not now, and not ever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there are times where we sit back and look at this world and we think this is such a dark place. When we hear of shootings and murders and hatred being spewed all over, when we think of the racism and the anger that people have, when we look in parts of this world where our brothers and sisters in Christ are meeting in secret today because if they're found, they could be put to death. God, we realize that we are in dark times as well. And yet we know that Jesus is light and life. And though things may seem overwhelmingly dark, that darkness cannot overcome the light of the world. So Jesus, may you shine bright in this world. May you shine bright through us as we carry the gospel to this dark world. It doesn't take much to bring light to a dark place. So may we share your word, may we share your love to this dark place and light it up. Thank you, Jesus, that you are life and light. It's in his name I pray. Amen. And so, again, we talk about this idea of having Jesus, we don't walk in darkness. But if you don't know what that's like, <laughs> the next step is to follow Jesus. So if you want to talk about what that next step looks like, and we have some people at the beginning point on the lobby, we would love to talk to you about what that means to have this life that is light.